Hallelujah. My song today is about the one. It's about the one who always hears our cry. Amen. He will never leave us. He will never leave us hanging. You know. His Wi-Fi is always on. Amen. And his name is Jesus. My song is entitled, Cry Out to Jesus. Let's wipe my sweat over here. <clears throat> You had well not enough when you said goodbye, and to all of the people with burdens and pains keeping you back from your life, you believe that there's nothing and there is no one who can make it right. There is hope for the helpless, rest for the weary, love for the broken heart. And there is grace and forgiveness, mercy and healing. He'll meet you wherever you are. Cry out to Jesus. Cry out to Jesus. For the marriage that's struggling just to hang on, the lost of their fate love. And they have done all they can to make it right again, still it's not enough. For the ones who can break the addictions and chains, you try to give up, but you've come back again. Just remember that you're not alone in your shame and your suffering. There is hope for the helpless, rest for the worry, love for the broken heart. There is grace and forgiveness, mercy and healing will meet you wherever you are. Cry out to Jesus, when you're lonely and it feels like the whole world is falling on you, you just reach out, you just cry out to Jesus, cry to Jesus. Struggles with being alone, wiping the tears from her eyes. For the children around the world without a home, say your prayer tonight. There is hope for the helpless, rest for the weary, and love for the broken heart. There is praise and forgiveness, mercy and healing will meet you wherever you are. There is hope for the helpless, rest for the weary, love for the broken heart. There is praise and forgiveness, mercy and healing will meet you wherever you This is our last subject for the series, Advancing the Kingdom of God. 
So today, I would like to share with you the pursuit for God's kingdom. It's something that is very important. So when we talk about pursuit, pursuit means, according to the dictionary, an effort to secure or attain or quest. So everybody is pursuing something, okay? Everybody is uh, looking for something to, to attain. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, Do not lay up your, for yourselves treasure on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, we ask your blessing as we study the Word of God to help us understand your words and we pray God that you bless our heart even our spirit to receive the incorruptible eternal words of God break every yoke of the enemy in our mind in our in our heart in our spirit and whatever works of darkness God break it remove it in the name of Jesus and we just allow your spirit to move freely in our hearts today and plant those seeds Lord in our spirit that it may grow thereby and help us also, Lord God, to be strong in our faith. Father, we thank you. We just want to honor and give you praise, God, as your name be lifted up in our midst. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. People are engaged in pursuing many things for, for their lives. Uh, some pursue uh, their career. Some pursue for greatness, some pursue for happiness, some pursue for the well-being of their family, some pursue for higher education. So everybody um, is pursuing something. Now as believers, as Christians, we need to pursue the kingdom of God. How much do you love God? So when it comes to loving God, it's very important to know how much we love God. I heard a story about the parable of giving. In our convention, one pastor shared about the parable of giving, demonstrating how much he loves God. And he said, there are three kinds of givers. The first one, he put a small bowl and he said, I will throw the money up and whatever goes down to the bowl, it belongs to him and whatever goes outside the bowl, it belongs to me. Then the second one, he put a big bowl and he throw up the money up, whatever goes in the bowl, belongs to me whatever goes outside the bowl belongs to God of course you throw the money like this then the other one he said to the two per, to, to the two guys you don't love God that much let me show you how much I love God this is my money and I will throw the money up What's, whatever stays up belongs to him whatever goes down belongs to me <laughs> how much do you love God sometimes we measure our love by the things that we have but God measured his love when he gave his only begotten son he gave everything So as Christians, why we need to pursue the kingdom of God? And to answer that question, we need to see several lessons from the parables of Jesus itself. There are 46 parables in the Bible, especially from the book of Mark, Luke, and John. And several in the, in the book of Matthew. Now, we're going to get several of those parables 
So the parables of Jesus embody much of his fundamental teaching. And they are quite simple, yet powerful, memorable stories uh, with one single message but so many insights. And if you will study his parables, you will notice the chronological order with lessons to itself. There are some foundational parables. It focuses on a new story being told that is not to be hidden and it serves as a foundation for what's coming next. So like the parables of the sower and four types of soil and the parable of the weeds among good plants, those are foundational. Uprooting those uh, hard hearts. Then there's also a group of parables talking about the kingdom of heaven. Like growing seed and yeast and valuable and valuable pearls. And there are also some parables talking about our behavior. How, he, how we would act as Christians in different situations as disciples of the Lord, as followers of God, as workers of God. And there are also parables about using our talents. Uh, and uh, remaining watchful and faithful before God. And there are also parables discussing about God's judgment and accountability. So basically, it's a progression of a Christian life, all those parables, if you are going to study uh, those parables. Now, giving you several insights about this, why we pursue God's kingdom. Why, why we pursue God's kingdom? If you, are, if you are pursuing something, it means something to you. It's very important. The reason why you, you pursue those things, maybe your career or your education or your uh, relationship. Now, we as believers, why we pursue God's kingdom? I would like to give you only four. Number one is this. We pursue God's kingdom because of our love for Him. Do you love the Lord? So, in what way you base your love to God? Is it a small bowl, a big bowl, or you're just whatever, Lord? The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, I love those who love me, and those who seek me diligently will find me. Now, let's use one parable in the Bible. In Luke chapter 7, beginning verse 41 to 47, the parable of the money lender. Two men owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him. Or to pay him back. So he canceled the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. So two guys with huge debt and Jesus questioned, who, whom do you think will love the money lender? Then he said this one, as we continue in that particular passage. Then he turned towards the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has put perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. For she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little, loves little. The message of this parable to Simon seems to be Jesus' words in verse 47. That's the key word. Her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. And it will always reflect to our Christian walk with God. You know your background. You know who you are before. And that's the reason I love God very much because I knew I cannot deny all those mistakes and sins 
and all kinds of things that I have done before God, things that hurt God. And I'm so thankful because God gave me another chance to live. God gave me another chance to, to serve Him. God gave me such kind of opportunity to know Him more. Because I know in my heart, I am a sinner. I have so many sins in my life. And it is only because of the grace of God that I can love Him more. So the parable was composed to confront the unforgiving Pharisee with the limitless of God's readiness to forgive. He doesn't know how to forgive. He doesn't know how to accept that he was loved by God. Because in his heart, why do I need to love God? I'm not that kind of person like, like, like that lady. He was, she's a sinner. And she deserves that. I'm a sinner, but, you know, little bit. I am better than anybody. So, the woman's lavish actions are the result of her great debt that has been forgiven. And in contrast, Simon's stingy actions stem from his failure to realize that he needs to be forgiven. And sometimes there are so many people like Simon who thought that I don't need much of God to have information and knowledge about God. I think that's enough. But you know what? It's not enough to have just the knowledge of God. It's not enough just to have some information about God. That's why every time we come to that understanding how much do we love God. So now we need to see the incredible graciousness, the incredible mercy, the incredible forgiveness of God like the creditor who forgave both debtors. That's the theme of the parable is one of God's forgiveness and grace. If you understand how simple you are, if you understand how stingy your life was, if you understand where you are going, you're going to hell, and all of a sudden when you let Jesus Christ be the Lord and Savior of your life, and then God gave you the grace, God gave you another chance to live, God gave you an opportunity to walk and to understand His will and His way, are you not going to love Him more? See, when you apply this parable, we need to see the incredible forgiveness of God. That in spite of your weaknesses, in spite of your, of, of your sins and simple acts, God is always willing to forgive you. For some, seeing God's mercy is easy because, you know, their past is like that of the simple woman or the debtor with a large debt. That's why no wonder those prostitutes who came to the knowledge of Jesus Christ, they are great lovers of God. Done to those who just raised up from the church. There are so many Christians, they were being raised up in the church and they thought they are not sinners. And they thought they are, they are just making small mistakes. No, the Bible says everyone is a sinner and every sinner will go to hell. And the only way to be escaped from hell is to have that grace from God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We, we cannot save ourselves. And that's the reason why the question is always giving us a challenge. How much do we love God? The way we act, the way we do things, you know, if you are in love with someone, amen, you're willing to do anything to please that to someone whom you love. Hello, are you with me? Especially if you have a big love, you are crazy enough to that someone. You're willing to do anything. 
Now the question is, are you crazy enough for Jesus? Amen. Out of incredible gratitude and love, they respond lavishly, honoring Jesus in every imaginable way. See, she's willing to give her, her best perfume for the Lord. In the eyes of those people around them, it's a crazy thing. And they're using her hair, her tears, just to worship, to honor, to express her love to Jesus. Do you still remember or did you already act something like a crazy act? just to express your love to God in the eyes of man it's crazy it's craziness but in the eyes of God when you do it for the Lord it pleases him so if you if you haven't tried that try to think what is the most uh, craziest thing that I can do for the Lord try let's say you go to Waikele and preach the gospel you know there in the, and the people will look at you that's crazy but you know what if you will do that yes in the eyes of God in the eyes of man it's like you lost something in your head but in the eyes of God, you are pleasing the Lord. When you share something, a small track, a word of God, you know, in the eyes of people, it's, it's useless. It's it's crazy thing. In the eyes of God, you're doing it not for anybody. You're doing it for the Lord. How much do we love God why we pursue God's kingdom because of our love for him amen because of our love for him the second one is this we pursue God's kingdom for fruitfulness we pursue God's kingdom for fruitfulness the Bible says I am the vine and you are the branches he who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. So another parable in the Bible. In the Bible, there are so many parables about the vine and the branches. There's also another one, the big, uh, the, the barren fig tree and the sower. In Luke chapter 13. Beginning in verse 6 to 9, the Bible says, And Jesus told this story, A man planted a fig tree in his garden and came again and again to see if there was any fruit of, on it. But he was always disappointed. Finally, he said to his gardener, I've waited three years and there hasn't been a single fig. Cut it down. It's just taking up space in the garden. The gardener is the Lord Jesus Christ. And the owner of the field it's not only done, but God the Father. And in this parable, the, 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 the one taking care of the garden said this word, Sir, give it one more chance. Leave it another year. And I'll give it special attention and plenty of fertilizer. If we get figs next year, fine. If not, then you cut it down. God is a God of a second chance. Hello, are you with me? So the parable of a fig tree in the vineyard. So the fig tree failed to bear fruit for many reasons. And the vineyard owner told the vineyard keeper to cut it down. Put the fig to the ground to better use. But the vineyard keeper the gardener interceded for the fig tree and asked that it will be given another season to be given another chance and some encouragement like fertilizer 
to see whether it might bear fruit the next year. See, the reason why we pursue the, 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 the kingdom of God is because it is God's will for the believer to bear fruit. To bear fruit. And God is so patient to all of those believers giving us more fertilizer Sunday every Sunday Wednesday every Wednesday plus DGs and Bible studies fertilizing our heart with the Word of God and prayers and intercession one of our the, the greatest intercessor is no other than but the Lord Jesus Christ and he keeps giving us fertilizer you know, in order for us to grow, in order for us to bear fruit. And if you are detached from the vine, it will be impossible for you to have fruits. That's why you need to be attached with the vine. And the vine is no other than but the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? We need to be fruitful. Everybody say fruitful. We want to be fruitful. We need to have those fruits one day. The Bible says that if the vine or the fig is not bearing fruit, time will come. The owner of the vineyard, they will cut the vine. They will cut it. God is a God of many chances. I hope it's not only one year. God gave us so many years already. Now, try to think about it. Lord, don't cut me down. I want to be fruitful. And if that's the desire of your heart, Lord, put more fertilizer in my life. I need more of God's word. I need more of God's presence. Don't you know there are so many Christians today, they don't care about God's word anymore. It is God's will and it, it is God's design for us to be fruitful. The Bible says in John chapter 15, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should what? Go and bear fruit. And that your fruit shall remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, we give it to you. Don't you know our fruitfulness is connected to our prayer? Amen? It is connected to our prayer. And that's the reason why if we are uh, connected with the vine, the flow of life from the vine to the branches will, will flow. And it will give us many chances to, to bear fruits. And the Bible says, You did not choose me, but I have chosen you. And appointed you, you should go and bear fruit. It's time to be fruitful. The reason why we pursue the kingdom of God is for us to be fruitful every single day, to be fruitful in the Lord. How's your fruit today? Pruti, pruti. <laughs> the third one, why? We pursue God's kingdom is for fellowship. The Bible says, And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. See, when you seek the Lord, you have to seek God with all of your heart. You can't find God using your two physical eyes. You can find God using your heart. That's why this guy said, As for me, I will seek God. And to God, I will commit my cause. Why? Job, he was blessed by God. God entrusted to him so many things, family, treasures, so on and so forth. Then all of a sudden, in one day, everything was gone. All of his kids died. All of his treasures, his livestock were gone. Even his health. And even his wife. 
His wife told him, Curse God and die. But thank God for the life of Job. He said, As for me, I will seek God. And to God, I will commit my cause. One thing I learned from the life of Job, if I cannot change my world, I can change myself. And because of that perspective, he knew many things were gone. His family, his livestock, even his health. But his attitude is still the same. As for me, I will seek God. And to God, I will commit my cause. In other words, I don't care what the world can do to me. I don't care what's going on in my world. I don't care what's happening in my family. I don't care. It's not because he doesn't love his family. But he knew his main focus is the one who gave his family. The one who gave his livestock. The one who gave his everything. His God. Amen. You have to understand. God sees everything, all of our struggles and all of our problems. The problem sometimes, if we have so many struggles and problems, we quit. We are so quick to quit. We are so quick to give up. And we are so quick to blame God. Lord, why you uh, giving me all of these things? Why I'm suffering all this kind of suffering? But Job has a different perspective in life. As for me, I will seek God. And to God, I will commit my cause. To whom are you going to commit your cause? Commit your cause to God. Amen? See, remember the parable of the prodigal son? In Luke chapter 15, verse 11 and 32. So the main character is, is too long. That's why you, you can just write it down and, and, and read it. The main character in the, in the parable, the youngest son, he went to a far country after he took all his treasures from his father while the father is still alive. And he lived a prodigal life in that far country until such a time that that place experienced famine. And from his life, a prodigal life, he, he became bankrupt and he applied to become a ta uh, caretaker of the pigs and even the food of the figs. He ate some of them. And, and, and you see, in the heart of this young guy, he came to his mind, he came to his reason. In my father's house are many servants. I will return to my father. And I will ask forgiveness to forgive me. And then when he returned to his reason and went to his house, he saw his father waiting for him for so many years, waiting for him. The father ran towards him and he embraced him and gave him so many new things in his life. And the father said, my son is dead, but now he is alive. He was lost, but now he was found. So the main character in the parable the forgiving father whose character remains constant throughout the story is a picture of God. That God is always constant waiting for the prodigal people. Waiting for those people who wasted their lives because the father God is longing for the fellowship of his children. So in telling this story, Jesus identifies himself with God in his loving attitude to the lost. The younger son symbolizes the lost. Like those who are, you know, backslidden Christians. And the elder brother represents the self-righteous believers. That they always blame those who made mistakes. And they thought that they are okay because, you know, they keep, they, they, they stayed in, in, let's say, in the house of the Father or, let's say, in the, in the church. Those backsliders, they are, they deserve to be condemned. Church, the major theme 
of this parable seems not to be so much the conversion of the sinner as in the previous two parables of Luke chapter 15, but rather the restoration of a believer into fellowship with the Father. The son lost his fellowship with the Father, but the Father is still waiting for the son to return. And when the son came to his mind, to his reason, he returned to his father's house and the father is still waiting for him. See the progression through the three parables from the relationship of one to one in 10 in Luke chapter 15 regarding the lifestyle of many people who think that they don't deserve the second chance of God because they are too, too much of a sinner. And this prodigal son who came and returned to the father's fold, the father is waiting. And he embraced his son. And he accepted again his son. And he said, you are lost, now you are found. You are dead, now you are alive. And I am willing to give you another chance. And I still remember how precious that time when I returned to the father. I was a backslidden for five and a half years. Five and a half years of worst of my worst years in, in my life. And I thank God the time that I was touched again by God, the time that I returned to the Father, I said, God, who am I that you love me so much? I still remember when I returned to God, when I accepted Jesus Christ. Again, I was so drunk. I'm vomiting together with my best friend. And when I accepted Jesus, my vomit, my tears, even the thing in my nose, it mixed together. But after that, I'm so happy. And I said, God, thank you so much. Thank you so much for the love you have given me. The Father is waiting. The reason why we pursue the kingdom of God because God is longing for our fellowship. God is longing for our fellowship. We've been fellowshipping with the world too long. We've been compromising our faith for too long. We've been compromising the good things of God for too long. It's time. It's time to have fellowship with the Father. And I'll tell you, God will never condemn you. No matter how many, thing, how many mistakes you have made or how much you mess up your life, it doesn't matter anymore because the Father's hands are always open, waiting for His prodigal son and prodigal daughter to return to His fold. The Bible says, You they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God, they ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching God. So if you understand the principles of God's love, it doesn't matter anymore how many bad things happen to you. It doesn't matter anymore how many sins you have committed because you have that kind of delight in approaching God. In other words, Lord, I'm here. I'm a sinner. I have many mistakes. I mess up my love. But anyway, I will approach you. This is my delight. This is my joy. This is my happiness. God, I am willing to, have, to join with you in my fellowship with you. Because you died for me. And you are willing to do something good for me. You seek me daily. When you seek God daily, God will continue to release his grace and His might daily in our lives. Amen. We pursue the kingdom of God for fellowship. That's why, how much do you love God? If you love God that little, you will pursue fellowship little. You will always say, ah, too long, too long, too long, too long. In your quiet time, you are always in a hurry. 
in your fellowship with God, you're always in a hurry. You know, if you're in love with someone, you're willing to talk, talk, and talk. Even sometimes, you know already the history. You know already the story. You know, those who are in love, you talk the same stories over and over and over again. Why sometimes girlfriend and boyfriend are sweeter than husband and wife? Huh? What's the problem? <laughs> Look, observe those boyfriend and girlfriend. They, they, they are sweet. They talk the same stories over and over again. But husband and wife, when, when, when you talk your story 10 years ago, the husband will sleep. Oh my goodness, the same story again. What's happening? Come on, give me a new story. Hello, are you with me? How much do you love God? But let me encourage you. Don't treat God as your boyfriend. Don't treat God as your girlfriend. God is your father. Waiting for your fellowship. And it doesn't matter how much you mess up your life. God is willing to listen to your story. We pursue God's kingdom to be more faithful. The Bible says in Psalms 101, My eyes shall be on the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He who walks in a perfect way, he shall serve me. You know, if you are going to try to imagine that, imagine that God is looking at you and God is telling you, Hey, Hey, look at me. See, look. Look. My eyes. You can't hide. You, you, you cannot hide. My eyes shall be on the faithful of the land. That they may dwell with me. He who walks in a perfect way, he shall serve me. The faithful will serve God. Jesus is coming back again. Up to what extent you will be faithful to the Lord? Up to what extent? Let's see the parable in Luke chapter 12, verse 42. And the Lord replied, A faithful, sensible servant is one to whom the master can give the responsibility of managing his other household servants and feeding them. If the master returns and finds that the servant has done a good job, there will be a reward. I tell you the truth. The master will put that servant in charge of all he owns. What a blessing. The owner, the master, went somewhere else and gave all the, the delegated authority to his servant. It was, he, he was a sensible servant. But waiting and waiting and waiting, too long waiting for the master, all of a sudden, the heart changed. But what if the servant thinks, my master won't be back for a while? And he begins beating the other servants, partying and getting drunk. The master will return unannounced and unexpected, and he will cut the servant in pieces and banish him with the unfaithful. So all of a sudden, he was sensible before. Now he keeps waiting. Oh, the master is too. <clears throat> We've been waiting for too long. Maybe it's coming by next season. I'm, I'm bored. Now I'm going to play with these guys. Since the master is not around, I am the boss. And he beat those other servants. See, we need to be faithful. God gave us so much. Talents, treasures, time and everything. And Jesus is coming back again. While he's preparing something for us up there in heaven, we need to be faithful down here on earth. We need to be faithful serving God. We need to be faithful serving one another. We need to be faithful serving in the ministry of God. We need to be faithful if we are working 
in, in your working place, you need to be faithful. Praise God. Don't, don't act as an arrogant, spoiled brat, believer speaking in tongue, Pentecostal Christian. Because one day, Jesus will come again. And whatever you do here on earth, you will stand and you are accountable before the presence of God. Amen. What we need to do is to keep our heart under the presence of God in the spirit of humility and love. We have no right to, to point our fingers to anyone. We need to be faithful to the Lord. We are only saved by grace. The Bible says, and in verse 47, And a servant who knows what the master wants, but isn't prepared and doesn't carry out those instructions will be severely punished. But someone who does not know and then does something wrong will be punished only lightly. When someone has been given much, much will be required in return. And when someone has been entrusted with much, even more will be required. See, the more God gave you on your shoulder, your responsibility, your duties as Christians, as believers, or your, if, if you are a father, your boss, an employer, etc., you know, God gave you much and much will be required that's why i would like to encourage you if you are a leader of the church a pastor if you are an employer supervisor there's someone under you take care of your testimony because your testimony is not being preserved in front of people but in front of god hello are you with me Proverbs 28, 20 says, I'm sorry, Matthew 25, His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. So when the master comes, he will recognize those who are faithful. And the Bible says, Well done, good and faithful servant. Amen. So we need to be, to be good. We need to be faithful. We are doing it not to anybody. We are doing it for the Lord. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. One preacher said this. The parable identifies four kinds of servant. And I quote, One servant one who knows what he should do and does the right thing. The other servant, one who knows what he should do but does the wrong thing. The other one, one who knows what he should do but doesn't do anything. And the other one, one who does not know what he should do and does the wrong thing. So what kind of servant? We are in the presence of God. And which one do you identify with? I hope and pray. Praise God. Whatever God entrusted unto us, let's do the right thing and be faithful until the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because He said in His word, And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to His word. He wants to bless us. He wants to empower us. He wants to do great things in our lives. That's the reason why we need to pursue the kingdom of God because we love God. Amen. Shall we all stand? Hallelujah.